Hello, I'm Llewellyn King. Uh, welcome to this webinar on behalf of United States Energy Association. Today, we are featuring Guidehouse, the international consultancy, its work in natural gas and the greening of natural gas, bringing natural grass, natural gas into the uh, community of acceptable fuels. We have today, uh, Guy Peters is a director of Bright House. He comes to us from Amsterdam, where he has had extensive experience with uh, working with governments, with nonprofit organizations in the whole area of environment and making fuels acceptable environmentally. And from Washington, D.C., Mark Eisenhower is a partner at Guidehouse in Washington. He has extensive management, consulting experience, and personal uh, travel around the globe on issues relating to natural gas. This is a, a program in which we are aiming to answer the questions that the hypothetical decarbonization, which we're looking for in the world by 2050, to answer some of those questions. Mark, welcome to the broadcast. Uh, Don, welcome to the broadcast. And Mark, would you like to start? Well, thank you, uh, Llewellyn, and to the USEA for having us this morning. Uh, my name is Mark Eisenhower. I'm a partner with Guidehouse. Uh, I have spent uh, the majority of my career in and around the natural gas value chain. Uh, started uh, with the deregulation of natural gas, uh, been through the cycle of uh, insufficient supply all the way through uh, the development of the shale plays and the, and the situation we find ourselves today uh, where we have uh, sufficient resources in natural gas to, uh, to make quite a change in our energy uh, system. So um, I joined Guidehouse uh, about a year ago. I have been working with uh, Don and others uh, primarily on the policy, regulatory, and strategy issues uh, related to helping companies understand how to move towards mid-century decarbonization goals and how the natural gas infrastructure and the electric systems are complementary and how we can bring those two together uh, to meet these mid-century climate goals. Thank you, Llewellyn. Uh, Don? Hello, Don. Hi, Llewellyn. Uh, yeah, great to be uh, on the show this morning. Um, I'm indeed based in the Netherlands. Uh, I've spent uh, the past 10 years in consultancy uh, for um, uh, worked uh, in policy uh, at the ministry, but also uh, in Brussels at the European Parliament, uh, focusing on renewable energy uh, for the past three or four years, mainly focusing on uh, gas infrastructure uh, the value uh, uh, of the gas infrastructure in the future um, towards decarbonization at mid-century, very much looking at uh, what is going to be the role of, uh, of hydrogen, uh, but also renewable natural gas, biomethane uh, in the mix, uh, and how to piece that all uh, together. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, Mark, are we going to be able to move natural gas into the zone of same zone as renewables, decarbonized. Is it going to join the green fuels? You need to turn your, your sound on. Uh, we have a problem with Mark sound. Llewellyn, hey, shall, I, shall I take a go? All right, Mark. Ah, okay. Uh, thanks. So Llewellyn, the work that we've been doing at Guidehouse would suggest that um, the, the pipeline infrastructure delivery system can in fact be used in a very beneficial way to meet these uh, mid-century greenhouse goal targets. Uh, one of the things that Dan mentioned is we've been looking at uh, renewable natural gas. Uh, the technology is there today to begin that journey. It's a very uh, vibrant technology. We have good feed stocks in North America to support that. Uh, but at the end of the day, 
uh, the feedstocks do have limitations. Uh, the work that, uh, that Don has been doing over in the EU and some of the other uh, reports that we've published indicate that if you complement that with hydrogen enriched natural gas and ultimately uh, standalone hydrogen systems, uh, we can in fact uh, take that journey with renewable products in the pipeline system and do it in a very beneficial way. And in Europe, uh, uh, Don, are we seeing leadership coming out of Europe or is leadership uh, coming out of the United States? Um, well, I think leadership is coming from a lot of places. Um, uh, this is really kind of an international uh, journey on, uh, on pretty much the same issues uh, everywhere, like uh, questions around, you know, to what extent do we want to electrify um, building seats, transport, what is possible, how to decarbonize heavy industry. So the same questions in, in different parts of the world. So I think in Europe, a lot is happening. Uh, there will be a European hydrogen strategy being launched uh, by the EU uh, on the 8th of July. Uh, we are currently at Guidehouse developing a, a European hydrogen backbone uh, plan with pretty much uh, the majority of the European gas infrastructure industry uh, input for that strategy. Um, a lot is happening. A lot of pieces uh, need to move in the, at, at the same time. Uh, the supply, uh, demand, uh, uh, transport, so a lot of moving pieces, uh, a lot of unsolved, unsolved questions, but certainly I do see uh, leadership and, and I do see a lot of excitement around this uh, uh, in Europe, but certainly also uh, other parts of the world, like the, the Olympic Games in Japan uh, next year uh, the, uh, have been announced as the Hydrogen Olympics. Uh, so there's really a lot going on in different, uh, different places. Where are we going to get the hydrogen? There are two ways, as I understand it, either reforming natural gas uh, for what is called blue hydrogen or green hydrogen, which is the electrolysis of water as the genesis of the hydrogen. Uh, what, is, what does the future look like? Yeah, hydrogen, I mean, don't, don't, uh, we shouldn't forget hydrogen is already used for, for decades in, in a variety of industries, in refining and in fertilizing industry, right, in chemical sector. So there's already a good... Uh, 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 volume of hydrogen being produced today based on natural gas. So indeed, like you indicated, uh, the kind of the steam meth methane reforming of natural gas. Um, it's possible to, to combine that with um, carbon capture and storage and store carbon uh, from that steam methane reforming process in, for example, empty uh, gas fields, uh, creating what is called blue hydrogen. Uh, there's also a lot of research and, 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 and testing and demonstrations uh, ongoing on what we call green hydrogen. So the, the splitting of, uh, of water uh, uh, using uh, renewable power uh, solar to create hydrogen from that. The, the cost of that green hydrogen is to be uh, higher than, than blue and, and, and let alone gray hydrogen. Uh, um, but there's a lot of developments, there's a lot of cost reductions uh, uh, that we see happening. Mark, are there other ways of greening natural gas, uh, for example, carbon capture and storage? Uh, in, indeed, there are, Llewellyn. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the key things, and, and many of the uh, companies here in North America have joined together uh, under a one program to reduce any methane emission uh, leaks uh, from the existing system. <clears throat> and I think we're making good progress there. Uh, but, you know, carbon capture together with uh, some of the hydrogen applications that Don has been talking about uh, is certainly one of, the, one of the solutions that we could look towards. Um, what, what do, where do you see the carbon that's removed, the carbon dioxide? Is it going to be pumped into the ground? Is it going to be used to stimulate more, more production of carbon fuels? Uh, what's, what is the solution to the sequestered? Uh, carbon. One can one method. Is, it, go ahead, Don. Yeah, can I take this question? So there's there's yeah. there's storage and there's uh, utilization, right? So either carbon is stored below ground, uh, for example, in empty gas fields, uh, but that has no economic value. So it's just 
cost, and it's just a carbon abatement measure. Uh, an option is also to sell uh, carbon to, for example, uh, soft drink producers, like, uh, you know, um, producing soft drink that have uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, in there to make it fizzy. Um, that has an economic value, that carbon, but the issue is that after drinking the soft drink, uh, the carbon is still uh, uh, released into the atmosphere. So when we look at carbon utilization, we are mainly looking at permanent utilization. So can we store carbon in building materials, in concrete, uh, to build buildings that will stay there for 50 years? So that is, uh, that is the journey to try to identify uh, economic uh, ways to, to store that carbon and utilize it, preferably. Mark, I'd like to place natural gas on the carbon spectrum. If we have, say, uh, uh, coal at one, and where would gas fit on a, on a table of one to ten in terms of its effect on the environment? When you look at uh, Llewellyn um, hydrocarbon naturally, uh, produced hydrocarbons. Natural gas is the cleanest burning of the fossil fuels. Uh, we have a lot of advanced technology such as that that's used in generation with turbines uh, that can efficiently and also at a reduced emissions burn those fuels. Uh, so within the spectrum, it's the lowest carbon footprint uh, of the uh, fossil fuels. So you would put it at about five, six, four, if it was a one to 10 with coal as the most severe. I don't know, Dan, do you want to you wanna put, put that on the scale? Yeah, it's about 40, uh, 30, 40% less carbon intensive compared to coal, I would say 40%. Thank you. Um, hydrogen, uh, a few decades ago, it was looked at as a possible transportation fuel, and it is again, but only now for heavy trucks. Uh, Tesla has uh, formed a separate company for heavy truck hydrogen propulsion using fuel cells. Uh, but now we're looking at hydrogen for utilities in a way that really hasn't happened before. Mark, do you see it being blended in with natural gas, being a freestanding fuel? And what are the advantages and the penalties of moving hydrogen into the electric generation system? Well, the first step, I think, uh, Llewellyn, would be to use hydrogen-enriched natural gas, so a certain percentage uh, of the existing natural gas production could be blended with hydrogen uh, with no material impact on uh, existing infrastructure or appliances or generation devices that would use the fuel. Um, as you move towards exclusive use of hydrogen, uh, then the appliances and the downstream consumption points, will the technology will need to change. Uh, but advances are being made with generation uh, there's been a few projects here in North America uh, that have been announced where they're going to use hydrogen uh, for generation purposes. Uh, so it, it's, you can start the journey with hydrogen and rich natural gas, and then there'll be applications uh, with standalone hydrogen storage and distribution systems in many cases for generation. And then there's other applications uh, that uh, uh, Don can probably explain uh, better than I can. Uh, industrial uses and things of that nature uh, where you just cannot electrify the process and you can use the hydrogen uh, in lieu of fossil fuels. Dan, did you want to explain? Yeah, could I just add to that? Yeah, thanks, Mark. So I think, um, I think when looking at uh, the future energy system, um, it is important to look at the various pieces, to look at okay, what can be the, the most beneficial role of hydrogen versus RNG versus electricity. Um, and, and really carving out. So we see um, that uh, renewable natural gas uh, can be very beneficial in, um, in older existing buildings in more temperate or colder climates in hybrid heating solutions. Um, because if you, if you use RNG there, you don't need to modify anything at the consumer side, uh, as opposed to hydrogen where you, where you would need to make some modifications. Um, so that can, be, that can be beneficial. Hydrogen, um, yeah, we see some, some, some sweet spots for the use of hydrogen and hard to electrify, um, um, but very carbon intensive in energy applications like heavy industry, uh, heavy trucking, uh, um, uh, so heavy transport um, and electricity production, right? So if you have a lot of 
uh, wind and solar, there is a need for uh, dispatchable, storable power. And of course, uh, uh, hydropower is, 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 is very apt for that, but uh, you can't scale that that much anymore. So there, uh, hydrogen uh, as a storable uh, molecule is, um, is, it will be very useful in the future. Years ago, I ran a conference, Mark, in, uh, it was out in California, but on value added for electric utilities. And the only thing that really seemed to strike any chord was green power, which at that time was a relatively new concept. And the companies had found that the customers, the ratepayers, were prepared to pay a premium if they thought that it was a non-polluting source, uh, either hydro or wind or solar. In those days, it was primarily hydro. Is there a similar dynamic with hydrogen? Will it be able to, will hydrogen enriched gas be able to get a premium in the marketplace? Will people seek it out? Will they prefer to have it? Will they feel somehow that they're doing their bit if they stipulate on their bill that they want hydrogen enriched gas? Have you looked at that dynamic? Uh, we are looking at that. Uh, Don has just completed a study where they did a deeper dive uh, on some of the economics and technologies associated with hydrogen. Uh, if we look at a fundamental forecast, uh, our work would suggest that the, you know, the all-in price to produce hydrogen uh, will come down on the cost curve as the technologies are implemented. Uh, but in the near term, uh, there's going to be a, a price point uh, difference between you know, today's energy prices and, and what those technologies uh, can afford. But in order to meet these mid-century goals, uh, we're going to have to deploy significant capital, uh, both in the electric value chain as well as the natural gas value chain. Um, and how we do that and, and the methodologies and technologies that we use, if we make good choices, uh, we can do that, uh, you know, to the economic advantage of, of end users. Uh, but we need to be very careful about how the policies are structured and what that pathway looks like. Since this webinar was announced, several people have written to me uh, pointing out that green hydrogen is very expensive, uh, particularly if it's generated by solar uh, or by wind, because the capital utilization of the hydrogen producing plant is very low, being that the wind doesn't blow all the time, or that the electricity generated at some parts of the cycle will all go to the grid and not to the production of hydrogen. The concept, I believe, is that you use the slack when there's no demand to make hydrogen uh, and it becomes a de facto storage. Uh, what have you learned? What are the economics that you've seen, Don? Yeah, so. Uh, it is true that green hydrogen today is uh, is expensive. It's more expensive than uh, than grey hydrogen. It's more expensive than, uh, and, and, and it's true that there is a conversion loss, right? When converting uh, a renewable power to hydrogen, uh, it's about 65, 70 percent uh, efficiency. Uh, we do see uh, cost reductions, uh, uh, rapid cost reductions um, in the market. Uh, so. Costs are coming down, uh, especially with solar PV uh, being produced uh, already in, in very su uh, sunny areas for two cents a kilowatt hour. Um, there is going to be a business case. So not today, uh, but, but in a couple of years. It is also uh, uh, important to look at the carbon budget uh, perspective. Uh, there is a large demand for renewable electricity for direct electricity use. So it doesn't make sense today to kind of reroute a lot of uh, renewable electricity to produce hydrogen when there's good uses for that renewable electricity as electricity. What we mainly look at, what I think, is that uh, by 2030, uh, in a lot of geographies, there will be um, such scale up of renewable electricity that it becomes to be, uh, then it becomes cheap but also possible without uh, carbon displacement effects uh, to really scale up very rapidly and very affordable uh, green hydrogen. Uh, are we going to get any hard numbers? Do you have any hard numbers on the penalty yeah. of 
of using hydrogen as against pure natural gas from a purely economic point of view. Yeah, yeah. So per, on a, maybe on a per megawatt hour basis uh, today, uh, green hydrogen uh, is about 70 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, natural gas uh, about 10, I believe in, in the US even cheaper and, and especially these days. Uh, so there's a huge uh, cost gap today. Um, I think we should compare green hydrogen, not with natural gas, but with natural gas plus carbon price. Uh, and the carbon price is uh, increasing uh, in, in, in various, uh, we do it and for the World Bank, every year a carbon price and, and, and state and trends report. Uh, so we have a very good overview of carbon price mechanisms across the world. Uh, with uh, green hydrogen production going down from the current 70 to uh, 50 and below 50 uh, in the next 10 years and the carbon price coming up uh, by 2030 uh, the picture may start to look different uh, and, and afterwards uh, there will be a point very soon after 2030 uh, where uh, it just makes a lot of sense to very rapidly scale up uh, green hydrogen. Uh, Mark, carbon capture and storage and usage, uh, how does that fit in with hydrogen? These are competing, at least cap in terms of capital, they're going to be competing. Uh, when do you capture the carbon? At the back end of a, a turbine? Is that the optimum way to do it? And what is that technology? And maybe Dan, do you want to answer that one? Dan? Sorry, Llewellyn, could you repeat that question? Uh, the question was, uh, where, with carbon capture utilization and storage, where is yeah. the optimum place to capture the carbon? Is it right. just at, the, at, the, at the back end of the turbine, uh, uh, whether it's a combined cycle or once through cycle, which one is it and where is it captured? And what is the technology yeah. for capturing the carbon? Yeah. So. I think uh, carbon capture and storage will be implemented first uh, at industry uh, uh, rather than power plants. So industry with a, uh, a lot of CCS projects in the past have failed, uh, but they were all uh, almost all uh, focusing on, on coal-fired power plants where the CO2 uh, is quite a lot of pollutants that need to be cleaned. Um, in industry with almost uh, continuous processes, uh, the process is cheaper. Um, so carbon capture at the plant, um, and uh, especially in those uh, uh, locations close to empty gas fields so that you don't have to build a lot of uh, CO2 infrastructure to, uh, to store it below ground. Uh, so that's where I think, so industrial clusters close to port locations uh, where yeah, capture uh, installations will be installed, uh, industrial plants. In the US, we do not have a carbon tax. It's talked about, but we don't have one. Without a carbon tax, how do we value the cost of carbon, therefore the value of clean gas? Mark? Yeah, that's a great question, Llewellyn. Um, some states have adopted uh, certain standards to accelerate um, things like uh, low carbon fuel standards or RINs uh, where, you know, the developers of renewable natural gas and some of these other technologies uh, can get a, an additional benefit uh, to help bridge that gap between today's delivered cost of energy versus what's the delivered cost utilizing these technologies. Um, it's, it's very state driven at the moment. Um, there's an eclectic mix really in North America of different uh, policies, uh, trying to get at that issue without some kind of national program on carbon. I'm speaking to you from New England, where there is a shortage of gas, but there also is a lot of opposition to new pipelines uh, in the belief that because gas is a carbon or fossil fuel, uh, that ergo it must be a, a, a carbon producer. How do you counter that? We're not actually in a position to do without it and hydrogen is not at hand. How do you counter that, Mark? 30% or more of our electricity is now produced from natural gas. 
So if, if you look at, at New England as an example, Llewellyn, um, in order to meet peak heating demand, so New England is, is uh, a little bit different than some other regions in the country, but if you converted uh, the, the heating load used to heat homes in New England, uh, you would almost double uh, the demand for electricity in that region. So, you know, then we turn the attention to if, if we move uh, towards an electrification scenario, you know, where does that production come from? Uh, there is insufficient renewables to meet that, uh, that level of increased demand. Um, over 60% of New England is, uh, electricity is currently generated with natural gas. So at least in the medium term, you're probably increasing demand from a generation perspective for natural gas. Um, and then we have the dilemma of limited infrastructure in order to get that product uh, to the market. So it, it becomes more of a complex uh, problem. Uh, there are, I mean, we're aware of the communities that are looking uh, to limit new, new gas hookups uh, or conversions, um, but we need to think about, you know, how these two systems, the natural gas infrastructure and the electric uh, systems work together, and how do we make that journey to the mid-century goals and use both systems in an effective way. Uh, it's not just as simple as, as converting uh, those heating, that heating demand um, to electricity. Um, among your guidehouse uh, customers, your clients, uh, what are the questions? Are the questions about the future centered on how can we get from here to there, or are they saying de facto a certain amount of carbon will have to be tolerated? And do you find a difference between the producers and the consumers, i.e. The, the gas uh, companies? and uh, the electric companies? The, the clients that we've been working with here in North America, and I'll let Don answer about uh, the EU uh, after I'm done, uh, have been focused on um, what are the policies uh, that need to be put in place uh, to incent the utility companies in particular uh, to make the capital investments that are required to decarbonize. Um, you, you know, we completely understand the communities that have concerns about burning fossil fuels. Uh, we can understand uh, what's driving that, uh, what they're trying to achieve. Um, but it's, as I said, it, it's a complex, it's a complex problem. So if you look at, you know, the history, and I, and I worked for a company, a uh, natural gas company who was in business for 100 years, uh, they did a very good job of what the stakeholders asked them to do, provide a safe, reliable, low cost product in order to generate the energy needed uh, to support the, the community. So now uh, we're asking the companies to do something different. We're asking them to take risks, uh, to embrace new technologies, to think differently about how they produce and distribute energy, do it in not only a cost effective way, uh, but also do it uh, to reduce carbon. And what we're finding is that the policies and the framework uh, is just not there to do that. Um, we need to be very careful uh, where we set those policies. There's a number of states uh, that have been very forward thinking and moving in a direction to set the policies in place to decarbonize, uh, but you also have many cities and towns. Um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, back with the development of the shale plays, uh, we were doing work in one particular state. Uh, they were wrestling with a tax issue and they were reluctant to address it on a state basis. Well, there was over 2,000 cities, towns, and municipalities that was then dealing with industry in terms of how to, you know, how to balance that, that tax revenue versus the implications of the industry operating in the state. Um, it's, it's very difficult uh, for these clients and, the, and these operating utilities uh, to put together strategies, capital plans, and execute them uh, if every city and town uh, has different policies and procedures. So we need, to, we need to bring this to a broader scale. We applaud what the communities and the states are doing, uh, but you really need to solve this in a, at a minimum and a regional basis. And, and Dan's done some very good work uh, where the EU is looking at this more holistically, and that's probably a better solution uh, than trying to solve this on a community by community basis. 
Yeah, maybe I could add uh, a couple of words. So I, I see that uh, a lot of clients uh, increasingly, especially consumer facing companies, uh, they would like to set uh, what is science-based climate targets. Uh, a couple of years ago, for example, we helped uh, McDonald's globally for all of their 40,000 restaurants and, and, op and, and supply chains to set a kind of a, a, an internal carbon, um, uh, basically a carbon target in line with um, uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, so we, we do a number of these, these projects. Um, recently, uh, also uh, energy uh, companies to think about their role uh, of, of uh, the, the future value of their assets. Uh, there is a debate on, you know, stranded assets going forward uh, could also turn around. So how can, how can you create value uh, in, in the future energy system out of your uh, existing uh, assets? So there's a lot of work uh, around that that we are doing uh, for, for uh, energy companies in, uh, in Europe. Uh, there's a very large uh, natural gas slash hydrogen development in the North Sea. Would you like to tell us about that, please? Yeah, yeah the idea is uh, to build uh, a very large amount of offshore wind in the North Sea, about 180 gigawatts. Uh, this, um, basically, until uh, recently, all of the North Sea countries like uh, the UK, Norway, Denmark, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, were all developing their own plans. And every um, uh, wind park, so every developer was also arranging their own connection to the shore. And after a while, it was thought, hey, this is not going to be very optimal. So let's collaborate. Uh, and a consortium was formed by uh, the North Sea uh, countries. Uh, collaborate to make sure to, to do a bit of planning. Okay, what is the best way to uh, create large offshore wind parks? And uh, what is the best way to bring all of that power onshore? And Guidehouse is supporting this group of countries with yeah, also um, uh, modeling kind of the best way to use existing energy infrastructure, both uh, electricity infrastructure and gas infrastructure uh, to produce uh, part of that energy in the form of hydrogen. Some very interesting results. The first uh, two energy islands uh, are in the planning for uh, 2023 uh, near the coast of Denmark. Uh, so here, this is the first example of very large scale up of offshore wind uh, using that energy in a combination of um, direct electricity and the surplus would be used to produce hydrogen. And where will the, where will the plants making the hydrogen be? They won't be? They won't be in the wind turbines, they won't be out in the ocean, they'll be onshore presumably. Yeah, there's been a, a bit of testing and we also supported that kind of, could you use, for, ex for example, um, obsolete uh, platforms on sea? Um, it looks like it is more cost optimal to uh, bring all of that power uh, sure via uh, DC cables, like just power cables, and then to have electrolysis plants or so green hydrogen production plants close to shore. Uh, close to existing gas infrastructure, so using existing gas infrastructure to bring it to the industrial centers uh, all the way up to the southern uh, part of Germany. I'm going to try to get our questions now, but I, I would like to know whether the electrolysis, technology changes everything. We're talking about natural gas in abundance because of technology, fracking primarily, but other technologies that have made producing it a lot more competitive and released a lot more of it. What about the evolving technology of electrolysis? Uh, has that been researched? Are the laboratories working on it? Are the companies pushing it? Are they trying to make a better plant for electrolysis? Yeah, there's about three or four competing technologies um, uh, that are being developed by companies uh, across the, the globe. Um, there is big research money also put into this by, by governments. Um, uh, so today, electrolysis are, are the, the most uh, used and the most uh, uh, tested ones. But yeah, going forward, uh, uh, this is kind of one of the questions. What will be the electrolyzer of the future? So various competing technologies uh, being further developed today. Uh, I have a first question, and I, I, I think it can be directed to whoever wishes to answer it. 
Can you also derive hydrogen or feedstocks of hydrogen out of coal, pet coke, waste plastics, biomass, waste gasification? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, you can produce uh, syn synthetic gas, so syn gas, out of that. You can gasify it, and then you you produce basically, uh, yeah, mixture of uh, hydrogen, methane. Uh, uh, yeah, you can do that. Uh, when you say gas is thirty to forty percent less carbon intensive than coal, on what basis do you make that claim? E.g., what uses and what uses and what factor in methane losses from infrastructure at 20 times the warming rate? I don't fully understand the question, but the, the, yeah. the thrust of it is, uh, what about, uh, are you counting in when you say it's, uh, it's less carbon uh, methane losses, which uh, Mark addressed somewhat earlier. Uh, Mark? Are we, are we getting on top of methane lo losses? And when you say it's 30 to 40% less carbon intensive, does that include methane losses from pipelines, production, et cetera? Uh, I think I'll, I'll let Dan answer the question regarding the, the percentages, but I think the, the infrastructure industry is making great strides uh, at reducing uh, methane losses from the wellhead to the burner tip. Um, we have a number of clients that have joined together on a national basis to drive that. Uh, there's many good programs out there to do that. Uh, there's good regulatory support for that. Uh, gas reliability and infrastructure programs exist in almost every state. Um, I can't think of a client that we have uh, that's not spending significant capital uh, in order to do that, to replace aging infrastructure uh, with updated technologies. Uh, plastic pipe and, and other uh, parts of the, the value chain that reduce emissions. So I think we're making great strides in that area. Um, I think most of the analysis that's out there in the public sector includes uh, methane emissions from the system. Uh, many of our clients track and report that. Uh, the losses on a regular basis of so the data is out there, uh, but I'll let Dan um, uh, provide more insights if he has them. Yeah, I've got little to add. I think on average, the, uh, the methane leak, so there is different estimates, right? And uh, the World Energy Outlook uh, also uh, discusses that. Uh, but um, yeah, it is, we can say it is an issue whether it's, uh, you know, half percent or, or more. Um, it is definitely important that, that gas infrastructure operators take it seriously. I, th I think they do, right? It uh, it's makes good business sense to to minimize this. There is rightfully so a lot of attention for this topic. A lot of it is related to the exploration and the, the production of gas. Um, going forward uh, with increasing uh, RNG or hydrogen, that part of methane leakage uh, will be eliminated. Uh, but yeah, like Mark says, there's rightfully a lot of attention to, to minimize these, uh, these losses. Andrew K. Dakos. Uh, what is renewable natural gas? Burning it still releases CO2. But the fact is that if you convert it to hydrogen, that's not so, is it? Hello? Renewable natural gas is basically biomethane. So uh, produced from, uh, from biomass, uh, either through uh, digestion or, or uh, gasification. So yeah, basically bi a form of bioenergy. Uh, that is produced uh, to, to make really a natural gas quality uh, gas. Uh, so it can be blended uh, in any percentage with, uh, with natural gas. Um, Jason McKenzie asks, why store H2 for electric generation when you can just store the electricity in grid scale systems like CAES, large batteries, pump storage, etc.? Would I you think it's a, yeah, I, I, Llewellyn, the answer to that question is an issue around duration. Um, you know, there is advancing electric storage. We are seeing utility scale projects in North America and Europe around electric storage. Uh, great advances are being made there, but you still have a, a duration issue. Uh, it's limited in terms of uh, the ability to respond. Uh, one of the key things that our clients 
are required to do is make sure that they're providing a resilient uh, energy system. And in order to do so, uh, seasonal storage and longer duration needs to be part of that reliable, resilient uh, production of energy. So uh, storing uh, hydrogen or, or other forms uh, of renewable energy, whether it's RNG or uh, things of that nature, uh, provides a much longer duration and the ability to meet, in particular, uh, seasonal demand uh, that cannot be met with current technologies around uh, battery storage. Uh, Jeffrey Epic asks, are there any potential issues, problems for using Syngas, H2 and CO, in, as a hydrogen source, or is it straightforward and simply a function of project execution? I'm not quite sure of the question. Does that strike any? Yeah, there? I think. Yeah. So um, I think it's it's uh, also this way of producing hydrogen is still more expensive than uh, uh, steam methane reforming today. So I don't see a particular technical issue. It's like we discussed earlier with green hydrogen. Uh, it's a matter of costs and, uh, and and getting the funding for that. So especially as you said, only a small part of the U.S. Uh, there, it has a carbon tax. So often uh, it's a direct comparison today be between yeah uh, natural gas and hydrogen with no carbon tax included. So that is, I think, the main issue. Another question from Andrew Kadak. Given the price of natural gas, won't the use of these greener alternatives have to be mandated by policy and regulation, which will raise the price for energy. Mark, would you like to have a go at that? Sure, uh, I, I think that in today's market, um, that is, that's an excellent question. Uh, the all-in cost to produce RNG, excluding uh, any uh, tax benefits or credits is probably three to four times uh, the cost of fossil fuel. So we need to find a way uh, to amortize those costs in a way that will encourage more development. As we, you know, as we encourage the developers to build more facilities, it's gonna drive down the cost curve. Uh, it's gonna reduce the capital deployed per unit of energy. And you know, I'm not uh, forecasting in the near term that they'll come into equilibrium. Uh, but when you look at the total socioeconomic cost, and the, and the goals that we're trying to achieve, you can't just look at you know, uh, product for product at the deliver point, you need to look at the total uh, societal costs involved in what we're trying to achieve. Um, Tommy, among clients, both in Europe and in the US, has there been any resistance to the greening of natural gas or are your clients enthusiastic about it with only questions about technology and money? In North America, we're finding that you know our clients very much uh, want to get to the mid-century goals. Uh, almost without exception, most of our clients have announced uh, corporate goals that are consistent with the uh, the Paris uh, uh, targets. Um, and so it it becomes a matter of are is the right structure, policy, and regulatory systems in place in order to encourage them to take that journey. Um, so it's not a it's not a lack of desire. It's what's the right what's the right pathway, um, and we need to be very mindful uh, as we move in that direction that we don't put ourselves in the position of finding that we have unintended consequences. So uh, Dan talked earlier about uh, stranded costs. That's a that's a key issue that has to be factored in. Um, you know, we've asked these companies to make capital investments that are long lived. Uh, they're on their balance sheets. They're part of rate base. Uh, and uh, it's not like an episode of Seinfeld where Kramer says, we'll just write it off. Uh, you know, we're going to need to figure out an equitable solution in order to help the companies do that. So it's, it's more complex uh, than one might think, but there's definitely a way to do it. Uh, but all the stakeholders have to understand uh, the broader uh, perspective uh, that will get us there and not just what does it cost to produce RNG versus what's the cost of a delivered decatherm from uh, the Haynesville Shale? We have a question from Jared Franceszek. 
and it's to all panelists. I have a question about the commercial basis for CCUS uh, being implemented by industrials. How do you see this developing, given that A, existing low rates of return for cement manufacturers, for example, may not allow them to absorb CapEx and OpEx costs, and B, passing those costs on to consumers is likely to affect competitiveness against competitors who don't implement CCUS. Uh, uh, let me may, maybe have start, uh, Mark. So I, I see a commercial basis for CCUS like CCS in those geographies uh, where there is a carbon price or like an auctioning system. So effectively uh, putting a price on carbon and then uh, you are competing. Uh, uh, okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to invest in renewables? Are you going to invest in CCS, uh, CCUS, or are you going to pay the carbon price? So that's where uh, CCUS plays against these other options. Um, if you indeed have a simple comparison, uh, 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 CCUS or not, or, or, or not uh, implementing CCUS uh, without a carbon price, and then obviously there's not a commercial basis uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, Mark, anything from you? I have no, I a that, good summary, Dan. I have a technical question moving to hydrogen and it's going to apply whether hydrogen is mixed with natural gas or whether it's freestanding hydrogen. And that is, of course, is a very light gas, the lightest, and it has a very small molecule and it's quite slippery. And uh, how will existing infrastructure handle it? Will the pipelines and pumps and compressors now used, even the storage systems, the compressed underground storage system, be able to accommodate uh, hydrogen without losses or without significant losses. Yeah, we are actually right now uh, doing a project for 11 uh, European gas infrastructure operators uh, together uh, transporting 80% of natural gas in, in, in Europe uh, to answer exactly this question. So uh, we're still in the middle of that work, uh, but what I can say is that um, uh, compressors, so you, uh, that, that's going to be um, an area of, uh, of, of, of investment. So you cannot use your existing gas compressors. You have to uh, compress, use maybe three or four or five times more energy to compress hydrogen to the extent uh, of, of uh, transporting the same amount of energy. So compressor uh, have to be um, um, retrofitted or renewed. In terms of and valves and metering stations. In terms of pipelines, uh, it looks like uh, existing pipelines can be used. They need to be uh, cleaned, uh, washed with, uh, with nitrogen, uh, but they could be used. They need to be checked if there's no cracks in them, uh, but, but good quality pipelines uh, could, be, could be repurposed for, uh, for hydrogen transport, dedicated hydrogen transport. Okay, well, that's, that's very interesting. I would like to raise the subject, which is simply of interest and that is I would like to know if Europe uh, is moving to protect uh, stranded assets that are environmentally uh, neutral or beneficial in the United States as Mark well knows we have a great difficulty in trying to keep nuclear power plants which are carbon free running because in the spot market price for electricity they're at a disadvantage uh, how do we protect going forward these noble green options, if we cannot, uh, if we cannot uh, uh, beat the market. Yeah, in, in Europe, um, uh, we see that uh, this is a, a really an, an area of debate uh, in many places. So uh, we see uh, in some places a coal phase out, like in Germany, uh, a partial nuclear phase out in, in France. Uh, there is a big uh, discussion uh, between different actors on what is the right way uh, forward. Uh, we also see wind energy basically eating up its own business case uh, uh, currently. Um, so there's different solutions in different, part, uh, different geographies. I think in Europe, ultimately, uh, carbon uh, is going to, to be the leading. So uh, 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 reducing carbon is going to drive 
ultimately the, the decisions on this. Um, what is the situation with green natural gas outside of Europe and the US? Uh, are we seeing moves in other countries, uh, yeah. Asia in particular, uh, to green their natural gas? Yeah, we do uh, some work in Singapore, uh, uh, also South Korea is moving. I already mentioned the, the hydrogen Olympics in, in Japan. Uh, uh, the hydrogen there will come from Australia and it's basically grey hydrogen, but still it is a, a promotion of hydrogen uh, in a way to, to, to kind of test. Um, but yeah, mainly in East Asia, uh, there's quite a lot of developments. Uh, Jason McKenzie, uh, uh Mackenzie uh, adds to the conversation, hasn't Germany been phasing out nuclear plants for more than 30 years? The implication being that they're getting rid of a lot of carbon zero generation for other reasons. Yeah, the issue in Germany is that they are uh, uh, phasing out nuclear and coal pretty much at the same time. Uh, and that is, uh, yeah, that is quite challenging now. Uh, Germany uh, published uh, a hydrogen strategy. They really want to ramp up very quickly uh, offshore wind and onshore wind. Uh, yeah, they have made it easy for themselves. Uh, that's, that's certainly true. Um, what, what about stabilizing the grid? As you move to, to uh, green energy, uh, I understand there are problems in Europe with stabilizing the grid, uh, but that does not affect uh, green hydrogen does it? That is purely a matter of what you do with the renewables like solar and wind, where you get a great variety of inputs into the grid fluctuating. Yeah, hydrogen pipeline transported hydrogen can help to stabilize the electricity grid. So basically reduce it uh, in times of uh, surplus wind or surplus solar, uh, Bring it and, and, and using it again at times um, uh, when it's needed. So this is what is sometimes called in Europe energy system integration. Uh, I seem to have lost my picture here, but let's go ahead. Um, uh, would you like Mark to tell us about your general feelings about natural gas going forward, where it fits into the national picture in the US and the global picture, the stability of supply in Europe, how stable is the frack gas here? Are we going to have frack gas for um, a century? And uh, what are we going to do uh, to keep it flowing where you get substantial local opposition to fracking? For example, I think that's the case in New York State. It's certainly the case in all of England where there's been a lot of hostility you know, to fracking. Um, go ahead, please. Sure. Um, so here in North America, Llewellyn, as you're aware, we have an abundant uh, supply uh, of reserves of natural gas. We have the right technologies uh, to extract that in a very efficient uh, and methodical way. Um, we need those fuels. It's part of the energy security of this country. It's part of uh, creating that resiliency and reliability that you were just talking to Dan about within the electric grid and the generation required to complement the renewables uh, that are growing in market share. Um, so we don't anticipate, I don't anticipate uh, in the foreseeable future that we have any concerns relative to the ability uh, to have the quantity of production required um, to, uh, uh, to generate the electricity from natural gas and to use that uh, in the other market segments that are current that currently exist. The journey to start bringing in uh, material amounts of renewable natural gas, hydrogen and rich natural gas and hydrogen uh, is going to take some time to do so. Um, and as we talked about earlier, you know, there's estimates uh, that have been published in recent studies uh, that, you know, you know, upper limits for renewable natural gas could be in the teens in terms of percent of the production. Uh, if we uh, carefully utilized all the feedstocks. So we're gonna need to bring the hydrogen in. It's a, it's a material part of the solution, uh, but it's gonna take uh, quite a while to do so. Uh, and in the interim, uh, we need to look at how we're using natural gas and how we can make that 
uh, cleaner, uh, not only with the one program and some of the other things that we've talked about earlier, uh, but how that fits with more and more renewables. And in Europe, Don, what is the, uh, what is the future attitude towards natural gas as opposed to other generating sources for electricity? We take it that the industrial uses are a given, that there's no substitute for yeah. natural gas in industry. Yeah, I would say the perspective is shifting a bit. So until quite recently, uh, natural gas was seen as the perfect uh, companion of wind and a way to uh, basically uh, reduce the, the share of uh, uh, coal with a higher GG intensity. In Europe, um, the perspective is shifting a bit. Um, uh, there's a lot of natural, actually natural gas use in Europe is increasing. So. Uh, uh, one hand, uh, uh, you know, consumers and, 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 and households, and uh, uh, it is it is in increasing. As, as uh, um, but on the other hand, there is a growing uh, sentiment that um, um, achieving decarbonization requires uh, uh, solutions also beyond natural gas. So hydrogen, RNG, electricity, like Mark says, uh, we're going to need uh, natural gas for the foreseeable future so at least in the next 10 to 20 years there will be very significant quantities of, of natural gas i see people in europe also see that uh, people uh, also have a long-term perspective and, uh, and and realize that if you want by mid-century to have a, an, another energy system you should start planning uh, now that's very interesting i have come to the sort of general feeling that there's often a 40-year lag in introducing a new energy source. It was basically 40 years that led from the early shale leases in, the, in 1974, 1975, 74, to uh, the development of fracking. Uh, would you agree with that, Mark? And uh, will it take 40 years to get, natural, uh, to get hydrogen fully integrated into the natural gas system? It, it's certainly going to take several decades. Uh, let's hope it's not 40 years, but um, you know, the, the advances where we used uh, fracturing in the natural gas industry have been around for decades, quite frankly. That's not an advent of the, shale, the recent shale plays, uh, although the techniques for horizontal drilling coupled with improved technologies on fracking have allowed us to extract the resource in a more efficient manner. Um, but uh, I, don't, uh, I don't foresee uh, any, any near-term issues uh, there. And do you think we will become in America, the US, become an increasing exporter of natural gas into Asia and Europe? Uh, we are already uh, seeing increases in exports uh, from the US. We've gone from a net importer to a net exporter, uh, especially with some of the LNG developments uh, it, and it becomes a question, Llewellyn, of how does U.S. produced natural gas compete on a global basis uh, with other sources of LNG uh, throughout the world? So we are not the exclusive producer of LNG, and it's a competitive open market. But uh, clearly, uh, not only are pipeline exports, as an example, to Mexico, uh, but LNG exports have been increasing uh, over the past decade, and we would expect uh, some continuing increases as uh, some of these other LNG projects come into commercial operation. So uh, the final question, but Don, is how reliable is supply in Europe, where Russia is a major producer of natural gas, but has also been known to uh, curtail supplies for political reasons. Uh, is yeah. Europe safe in its gas supply these days and going forward? Well, there's different perspectives on this uh, within Europe. Uh, uh, countries in Central and Eastern Europe uh, concerned about uh, 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 Nord Stream, uh, uh, the, the, the new big pipeline from Russia to Germany. Um, what we've seen is that the transits uh, through the Ukraine to Slovakia, Czech Republic and other countries um, has significantly dropped and countries like Poland are, are very concerned. Um, Security of supply is foreseen. I mean, Europe is connected with uh, Algeria. Um, uh, there's plenty of LNG terminals, uh, new ones pop up uh, almost every year. So security of supply is insured. And often what we see 
is that an LNG terminal is actually being used to improve the, the, um, the, the commercial position when negotiating uh, agreements, uh, purchase agreements on, on natural gas. The, uh, the greening of natural gas would seem to me to be one of the exciting projects of our time. Uh, how do you feel being associated with it as a parting shot, Mark? Uh, as I said, uh, Llewellyn, I've spent the majority of my career in the natural gas value chain. I think it's been very beneficial for our economy. And I am very excited to get up each day and help our clients uh, understand the, the pathways and scenarios to move forward, uh, to utilize all the great investments that we've made in order to hit these mid-century decarbonization goals. So a very exciting time uh, for me. And for you, Don? Yeah, likewise. It's, it's a great uh, uh, time to work on this uh, topic today with, uh, you know, renewable energy becoming uh, almost business as usual with a lot of questions on, on, on the pathway. So it requires a lot of, there's a lot of open questions, but a lot of excitement. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic uh, to work on. Great to be able to discuss it with you uh, today, Llewellyn. Thank you. That's the end of our program for today. This webinar is almost concluded. I'd like to thank very much uh, Guidehouse and uh, Don Peters and Mark Eisenhower for their participation and help, and also the United States Energy Association, which does a phenomenal job in looking at all sources of energy in the belief that it is good for people. In particular today, I'd like to thank Dominic Levings, Deepja Babhani, and Jake Swanson for making this program possible. Until next time, from the United States Energy Association and myself, Llewellyn King, cheers.